Anthony Roth Costanzo. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. To start, for people who don't know what a countertenor is, how do you describe it? You know, I sing in this very high register, which a lot of people call falsetto, and it is falsetto. It's this high voice, but falsetto has such an interesting history, beginning in the 18th century with castrati, the castrated men, who Handel and Mozart and Gluck and Vivaldi wrote all this operatic repertoire for. But it's really carried forward. Those, those castrati were the superstars of their era. And we see today a lot of falsetto singers in pop music, and we just assume that's the way it is, you know, from Prince to Michael Jackson to the Bee Gees to Justin Timberlake. There's lots of high male singing, and basically I do the same thing, but in an operatic way. And how do you do that with your voice? Is it a reach to find it? <laughs> you know, it's a little bit of a technique, but basically when you sing, your vocal cords come together and they vibrate. But if you bring them fully together because they're long as a male, then you have a lower voice, just like the long strings on a piano are lower. But I artificially shorten them. So I, I make a little chink and, th and through that chink air escapes, but I try and minimize that, but it sort of artificially shortens the chords. And why do you do it? When I was a boy soprano, I sang on Broadway and then I did opera and I loved singing high. And I never associated pitch with gender, which is something we do a lot in culture. We think that high is female and low is male. And therefore, a male singing high is emasculated in some way. But I've never experienced it that way. I feel it's an expression of my identity. I read that you use imagery when you sing. It's not something I've heard a lot of singers talk about. So how do I get these muscles and this whole mechanism to function the way I want? Well, if I send an image from my brain along with the impulse saying sing, it can kind of move the involuntary muscles in one way or another. So sometimes, you know, you're singing and you go, that's it, it felt great. But how can I recreate that feeling? Well, let's imagine a flower blooming or let's imagine, you know, uh, an oar going into the water or something like that. And if you use that imagery, it actually trains your imagination to control those muscles a little better. Then I wonder when you're performing, how does that coalesce with acting? Absolutely. You know, I think that acting is the foundation of what I do. And every musical choice I make is based on the drama or the story that I want to tell. Even if I'm singing Philip Glass and there are no words, I still want to tell a story. I still want the audience to experience uh, an emotional reaction to the sound that's coming out of me. So I try and make every musical and vocal choice based on either character, narrative, or um, some kind of emotional landscape, at least, that I'm putting forward. So even when I'm warming up and I'm going, ah, 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 instead of just making it bland, I go, okay, well, what would that sound like if it was really sad? Ah, 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 and it changes the nature of the sound. When you were younger, you had thyroid cancer, and of course, the treatment targeted the throat, the vocal cords, that, that vicinity. I'm wondering what kind of existential moment that was for you now, especially as you consider what your life is now. I feel so lucky to have had that experience, you know, where they scraped my thyroid off my vocal nerves, and that could have meant I, I wasn't going to sing again. And I had to think to myself, well, are you defined by singing? And what I realized is I'm defined by my creativity, by my desire to connect people through art. And so how can I have the most impact doing that? Sometimes it's singing, sometimes it's creating a production, helping other people use their voices metaphorically and literally in different ways. And what does that mean for the role of singing in your life now? Well, I love every moment and every day that I can sing. I love the act of it, um, and I love the catharsis of it from my own uh, experience. But I also like what it can do, especially the countertenor, in terms of drawing people in and making this art form which can seem very obscure and sometimes shrouded in elite institutions and things like that, more accessible. I suspect that's where an octave apart comes in. 
And Octave Apart is a show that I created with the incredible trans cabaret legend Justin Vivian Bond. And uh, it began because I wanted to find a sort of exhilaration in classical singing. Sometimes it feels very pure and very beautiful, but where's the, the exhilaration you get in a rock concert? So in the image of Julie Andrews and Carol Burnett at Carnegie Hall, Vivian and I created this show called Only an Octave Apart. Our voices, though an octave apart, seem worlds different, um, and yet we come together and uh, find this musical synergy and also this personal connection through the exploration of identity and the voice. Um, and it is both hilarious and poignant, and uh, there's an album that we made of it that's out, uh, so you can listen to it if you couldn't see the show. And the river bank talks of, of the waters of March, it's, it's the end of all strength. It's the joy in your heart. When you went back and listened to the album, what most struck you that, that totally works? We chose this one song that's a Peter Gabriel, Kate Bush duet, Don't Give Up. I was singing rather the Peter Gabriel part and Viv was singing the Kate Bush part and I'm talking about struggling so much with my life and Viv's voice comes on and says, don't give up, you still have us. But no one wants you. Don't give up, cause you have friends. I watched your Tiny Desk concert, by the way, and you just looked like you were having a ball. I have the best time with Justin Vivian Bond I've ever had on stage, and doing this whole project, I feel more like myself than I ever had on stage. Often I'm portraying a character or in a costume, and here I really am myself and have to find a way to actually perform myself and my singing on stage. Well, speaking of your characters, you have become so synonymous now with Akhenaten. Uh, how do you take that? How do you accept that mantle? Isn't it funny if you do something in your life and you think to yourself, when I die, if I'm lucky enough to get an obituary, someone will write, oh, he you know, famously played Akhenaten. The, the nudity, is that a brave choice? Would you consider it a brave choice? I think it, it serves a function in the storytelling or I wouldn't do it. You see this uh, soon-to-be pharaoh in the most vulnerable human state possible and you see him in a very cis male beginning that morphs over the course of the opera into a much more female incarnation. So it raises interesting questions, it brings the audience along on an intimate journey. In terms of my own approach, it is terrifying every time. Um, and so I guess there's an element of bravery about it, but there's also a sense of freedom. When you step on the stage, you accept that there's no going back because you're in front of thousands of people and you don't have any clothes on. So this is what it is. And then you let go. And instead of focusing people on the nudity aspect, you focus them on the kind of ritualistic aspect it can embody. So last November, you played Dracula for Boston Modern Orchestra Project. This is a piece written for you. What's that responsibility like? Well, John Corleano is a composer I've loved since I was a teenager. I feel thrilled that he wrote it for me and with a role that is so rich, so juicy, so uh, vocally challenging. <laughs> and simultaneously a popular culture story that is Dracula, but also brings in these Greek retellings from Euripides that give a whole nother dimension to it. And it goes to what I think you were talking about earlier about changing the form and, and creating new and something unexpected. You know, opera is a living art form, and we have to find ways for it to continue to morph and to grow and to be an outgrowth of our current time. Well, it's been such a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for a beautiful interview. Under pressure. Under pressure.